Let's bring on to the stage our first two uh, speakers, our first speaker, Anne Mukherjee, who is the chairman and uh, CEO of North America for Pernod Ricard, and the faculty director at the Center on Global Brand Leadership, uh, my colleague uh, and boss, Professor Baron Schmidt, and the Robert D. Calkins Professor of International Business at Columbia Business School, who will be moderating the discussion with Anne today. And uh, I leave it to the pair of you. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, now, I'm quite familiar with Pernod Ricard, as is Matt, and as is my colleague, um, my uh, colleague, uh, Michelle Farm, because we've been running some uh, programs for you for several years. And it's always a delight to, um, to do some work for uh, Pernod Ricard, whether it's educational or whether it is consulting. And Pernod Ricard um, has, of course, some great brands that we all know like Absolute and Shivas and Havana Club and many, many more. Um, you're on the spirits and wine business. So um, before we talk about the future, how have the last few months been for the business and the last week? Yeah, um, you know, consumption's at an all-time high. Um, <laughs> I would say it's been a, a fascinating journey since COVID, um, you know, not the most um, uh, easy environment. Uh, but this is a very robust category. Um, we're seeing very high growth. Um, and that's mainly because with all the bars and restaurants kind of closed, a lot of in-home consumption shifting from those venues into in-home. So business is, uh, while difficult, it is still robust. Um, we're seeing a lot of shifts happening. Um, you know, e-commerce, which was very uh, probably behind the times versus CPG, is now skyrocketing in growth because people want convenience. Um, so our ability to have the technology infrastructure, understanding how to play in the space, um, you know, we're we're learning a lot in a very short period of time to be agile. Uh, and I'm happy to say the company is doing well, and um, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to hear that, and I guess. Um, the crisis is not that bad for your business. Now, of course, in the future, there'll be other crises. Oh, yeah. uh, and we sometimes don't know what's coming, right? So um, right. so let me ask you more generally first. Um, so what are your sort of insights? What is your thinking about the future and especially the future of marketing, which is the topic of this uh, event today? Yeah, I think we are closely, you know, we, we've talked a lot about this whole new normal. Um, and I think we're past that. I think it's the now normal. Um, it is the only thing that's going to be certain in the future is uncertainty, uh, whether that's economic, political, um, environmental, um, health, it doesn't matter. So I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about at Pernod Ricard is this notion of advancing through ambiguity and making kind of adversity your advantage. And, and you know, in today's world, there are no rule books, you know, so what we're trying to teach the organization is, you know, what is the intersection of things that matter and things that you control? And if you as a leadership team and as a company don't understand that for your company, your employees will spin. And so, um, you know, too many companies are trying to figure out how to boil the ocean. And now more than ever, it's time to focus on what matters and really help the organization build the capability to be a learning learning organization to be able to adapt as, as you move forward. And I guess at the top level where you are, uh, these are these are the key challenges. They're organizational, right? They're broadly strategic. Um, but let me go through a few of these uh, sort of future developments that we can perhaps, perhaps expect and, and ask you uh, how you view them and also what sort of initiatives uh, your company might take in that, that regard. Why don't we start with um, technology? Because, I mean, technology has been uh, driving business for, I don't know, digitalization for the last 20 years, let's say, right? We had the World Wide Web, then we had e-commerce, then we had social media. Uh, you know, we have big data from a sort of research perspective, very important for marketing, right? Um, and we have mobile, mobile platforms. So that's been sort of what's been happening. Right? But now there's all sorts of other new technologies on the rise. Uh, AI, uh, AR, VR, IoT, <laughs> these are the buzzwords too, and the buzz acronyms, right? And, uh, and robotics. 
so let me let me go through those. Um, uh, like AI, how important is AI for a, a, a company in your business? You know, I think before I answer the AI question specifically, I think you know at the end of the day. Um, you know, when I think about technology, I try to remind my teams about two things. Technology, because of this thing called the smartphone, right? Um, it has been probably the biggest democratization tool for consumers that I've ever seen. Consumers can now buy anything they want at any price, any time, and the barriers to substitution are collapsing. And so as organizations, we have to first understand that is the profound impact of technology, right? And what it's done to disrupt uh, what I would call the um, traditional um, definitions of competitive advantage. So that's number one. Number two, um, you know, like anything else, like any invention in modern history, technology is just another enablement to do what you should be doing. And a lot of people, I think, make the mistake that, oh, here's the latest tool or toy in some case. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand your underlying company strategy, how your company operates, what will change because of the technology? Well, it, what advantage will it give you? Um, applying any technology is dangerous and costly. And if you think about the world of AI, you know, the beauty about AI is that it allows companies that know how to harness its power to be able to make decisions at the speed of business, which is really in today's ever-changing world, an incredible advantage. But knowing AI as it's still, you know, it doesn't mean that human intervention goes away. What's the heuristics under the AI that you need to build? What's the science that you need to, the behavioral science that you need to build? What, how is your organization set up? If you have a siloed organization and you start applying tools, the technologies just further, further silos you. So it's critical um, that I think in today's world, AI will help people um, you know, take out a lot of inefficiency in the system. We have a lot of people trying to make decision-making um, that is based either on experience or opinion. AI helps you understand what is predictable. And so if you don't have the organizational savvy to be able to take on these technologies, they really become expensive toys for a company. I understand. And so this actually applies to all the technologies that I mentioned, yep. um, not, only, not only to AI. And, uh, and um, I guess that the role of the consumer is also very, very critical in this. A relationship between technology and and your company, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, companies at the end, what we we can never forget is we're in the human being business. We're in the human mm -hmm. connections business, and when a brand has a relationship with its consumer, it's still got to feel that the brand cares about them, that the brand has values that they care about, and tools like VR and you know AR and all these wonderful things that bring brand experiences to life in ways that that's never been seen before, it has to be rooted in that creativity. It has to be rooted in creating that human connection. And if brands come off too slick and, you know, too, you know, this is a cool technology that the brand has applied, if it, if it doesn't go back to the heart of what the brand stands for, if it doesn't amplify that using the technology, then it's a wrong mm -hmm. use of that technology. I understand. And, uh, and, and if we talk about AR, VR, like augmented reality and virtual reality, and also robotics, I mean, there could be all sorts of gadgets coming. I don't know, uh, robot bartenders, right? Yes. Or, or yes. When you have a drink, you can immerse yourself in a new world and all of that. And, but for marketing, to do these sorts of um, fads or, or, or use these gadgets, or I mean, they attract attention to the consumer, don't, yeah, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so there is clearly some role for, for technology. Absolutely. And I think it goes back again to you understanding what the brand stands for. Um, you know, I, I know you're going to have some amazing speakers after me that are going to talk about, you know, some great applications that they've done. Um, you know, Mercado has done a great job with a, a lot of that in, in what he's done with Burger King. But I'll give you one example. If, if the brand kind of has that, um, kind of timeless story, you know, a, a brand that I'll, I'll talk to you about that is in my past, a brand like Doritos, 
you know, Doritos is a, is a brand that's about kind of young teenagers who are looking for the never been done, never been seen. And when they're looking for these experiences that just allows them to feel bold, you know, these kind of technologies bring to life the brand in ways they've never seen before. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, we created a, again, using technology, a, 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 a concert experience that we put in the hands of, of our consumer, you know, using a soundstage that looked like a, like a, um, a vending machine. And that technology, I mean, whether you were at the concert or not, using technology anywhere in the world, you were now connected to that concert experience and you were deciding the lights and the, you know, does smoke come out of the stage now? And what's the next song that's, that LL Cool J is going to sing? So, you know, if, if, it, if it works for the brand, there are so many ways to bring technology, to bring that experience in ways that consumers are just hungering for. Uh, let, let me switch over to um, brands and, and firms in, in society uh, yeah. these days. I mean, we see more and more social movements. We see uh, activism. We see uh, ideologies uh, in, in, in the sociocultural space. And that, of course, affects companies because companies are also part of a sociocultural space. Yeah. So what's your view on the future in turn, I mean, for brands in, yeah. in a societal, in a sociocultural context? Absolutely. You know, I think um, I think this notion of values was at a tipping point, you know, kind of pre-COVID. And I, and I think COVID has just accelerated that. And we are definitely now in a in a in a time in, in, in history where people just don't want to buy brands anymore. They want to buy into brands. They want to understand what you stand for and what you stand against. Now, as a marketer, it's really critical that when you take your brand into that space, that you have the credibility and the voice to take on whatever social cause may be important, right? So, you know, a brand has to be very thoughtful. You know, if I, if I'm a, if you know if I'm a brand that's just all about fun and you know it's 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 a break from my day, and now all of a sudden I'm talking about Black Lives Matter. Well, do you really have the credibility to do that? And then you have to ask yourselves, but if your brand does have a history, and I'll give you one example, Absolute. Absolute's had a history of cultural provocation. And whether it's back in the 80s and the proverbial door they opened at Studio 54 and brought gay rights to the forefront, you know, that's why this past year during Valentine's Day, we went further because there was a lot of chatter among our consumer groups around the Me Too movement. And while drinking responsibly is not just about, you know, don't drink and drive, alcohol has a lot of spaces where we need to talk about responsibility and consent is one of them. And we have to take on the fact that people are using alcohol as a weapon against victims. That's unacceptable. So if you're going to drink, you have to drink responsibly, you have to sex responsibly. And so we as a brand said that is a deep value for us. And we created a voice for people to go out and say, there is no kind of gray space around consent. A yes is only a yes when you hear a yes. And if you don't hear a yes, that's not consent. So I think you have to be thoughtful about which brands have the credibility, but but consumers are looking to understand why they want to buy into you. And, and basically you're saying you need to really also look at what is the core of the company and then get involved in initiatives that relate to that. But, but but when you do all of this nowadays, it seems to me you can still get it wrong. Oh yeah. I mean, companies are constantly getting into trouble. Just the last yes. few days we've seen gap uh, with an uh, advertisement, you know, becoming a major a conversation uh, uh, online. Uh, so um, I think more than ever, uh, uh, companies are sort of, on the watch by consumers, aren't they? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and then the issues, of course, uh, you have uh, you have various consumer groups that you need to satisfy. So, so how do you how do you balance all of this? I mean, it seems incredibly complicated to me. It is, but you know what I would say is a lot of companies, some have really good intent, but they were just tone deaf, right? And you know, this is why it's important that people are thoughtful before they go and do things like this. You know, in, in our, in, at Pernod Ricard, you know, at the heart of our company, back to your point about what does the company stand for? We're about conviviality. 
we're about bringing people together. It's about celebrating those human connections in safe and responsible ways. So it's at the core of our company. So when any of our brands want to go out and talk about things that may be important in society, you know, we have a system, whether it be our legal team, whether it be our public affairs team and our marketing team, we have wired the system that when we create content, when we want to put our voice out into the world, have we been thoughtful about it? And I think sometimes a lot of marketers, because they're, you know, they're, they're excited they might not be doing that due diligence before they go out the door. And so if that is not systemically built into your company, you can get into a lot of trouble. You just mentioned conviviality, right? <coughs> uh, I mean, in French, and in English, you, you said conviviality. It's a difficult right? It's been, it's been interesting, even teaching the American employee base what that word even <laughs> means. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, it basically means something like, you know, I'm German originally. We have something similar, Gemütlichkeit. But the French tell me that's not conviviality. No. <laughs> so, but it is the notion, isn't it, of like uh, drinking responsibly, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Together. Uh, and, and I guess having a... a a, a good time, a positive feeling, be, being yes. happy, and, and and also relating to others. So, at the very essence of your brand is actually this uh, this socially getting together notion, isn't it? Yes, yes. And you know, and I'll take that one step further. Um, back to what does it mean? I think we also have to be thinking today about it's you know, as a CEO, my job is to make sure we have return on investment. Well, in today's world that's mm -hmm. not enough. We have to think about return on responsibility. And a company that believes in you know, social connection in the midst of COVID, we actually, I think our, our chairman, Alex Ricard basically said, you know, we probably got that, that coined a little bit wrong. It isn't that we don't wanna, we wanna socially distance, we wanna physically distance, but we wanna stay socially connected, right? And so you know, that's why as a company this past summer, when there's been lots of discussion about social media and the hate on social media and many companies were asked to boycott. And while we understood that boycott, the problem is, is what happens the day after? And as advertisers and as, as people, if you are going to be buying social media, you have to understand what percentage of that is based on hate. I mean, this is to me akin to, you know, companies that were taken, you know, uh, that, that had issues with manufacturing with child labor. Mm. How, could you, how could you make that a part of how you built your business? We as advertisers have to do the same thing. And we need to partner with our social media platforms really to understand how do we remove that hate? How do we use our consumers? And this is something we've done with the ANA and I'm, and I'm so proud of it, but how do, you, how do you use the eyes of the consumers to report hate and then create the technology to be able to, to make that transparent and have the social media platforms take it down. Advertisers need to ask the question. It's not just the engagement or my CPM. I need to understand what percentage of that is hate and we need to remove that from the advertising we're buying. How important are like social influencers uh, nowadays in marketing for your company or in general? And, and, and also with respect to those social social issues. You know, again, I, it, for any, you know, social influencers are like, for me, any borrowed equity that a brand looks at, hmm. whether it's a sponsorship, whether it's, you know, what spokesman do you have for your brand on your commercials? Mm -hmm. right. You know, you have to make sure that the values of that social influencer matches the values of your brand and your company. Back to, again, that systemic system that you put in place to be able to vet that as you think through yet another tool for you to amplify your brand. Now, you came from marketing, is that right? Within I did. Yeah, I did. So you were the CMO, right? And, and now you're a CEO. So what are sort of, what's different? What are the new challenges and how, I mean, it's interesting to our students too, right? I mean, from marketing, you move into the CEO position. What, what, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm on a I'm on a um, campaign uh, to get more CEOs in, in in the world to come for marketing, and I'll tell you why. It's back to that point I made about technology um, uh, democratizing consumer choice. 
you know, if companies are to survive, and we've seen so many companies get disrupted because they weren't satisfying the entire need uh, of a consumer and they got disrupted. Kodak, I mean, I can go on, right? Blockbuster, yeah. we go on. If CEOs today don't understand that we live in a demand-driven world, it's not a supply-driven world anymore. It used to be if I built it and I created advantage over it, there was no way I was going to get disrupted. Those days are over. And so as a CEO, you have to understand the full picture, the demand side and the supply side. And so if CEOs don't understand this new world, they are not going to be able to drive sustainable growth for their companies. They will get disrupted. And I will say to the CMOs out there, if you truly have that passion to be a CEO, think about what you do in terms of driving the performance of your company through what you do in marketing. It's about work that works. It's about predictive science. It's about monetizing human behavior. And when you understand how you connect with the PL and you understand both the demand and supply side of the business, you can start creating the capabilities and the discipline that you need to become a CEO. And we need more CMOs to become CEOs. Now, uh, we've talked a lot about some future issues with technology and and the societal context that is increasingly important uh, for brands and for firms. But we started out with a with a pandemic and I, you, you used the phrase in the beginning, like this is sort of the, the new normal now. The now normal, uh, yeah. All right, so I'd like you to think about the post pandemic world. Um, that's a phrase that's being used these days. Um, I guess it means something like uh, the world in a year or maybe in two or three years which is sort of a planning horizon for many companies, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 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 I mean, what have you guys learned in the pandemic world that you will also use in the post-pandemic world? And how will the post-pandemic world be different from, uh, from the pre-pandemic world? You know, I, I, I think the biggest thing that we're going to learn and I urge everybody to think about is to survive in the pandemic world, most people are learning to be agile. Um, so I'm going to speak about this from two vantage points as a CEO. From a business standpoint, I think CEOs have to think about organizationally, how do they build agility into their organizational mm -hmm. capability? Because even in the post-pandemic world, I'll tell you, even in my industry, things are not going to go backwards to where it was pre-COVID. You know, people now understand the value of convenience in this category. E-commerce isn't going away. Um, you know, how people are making choice and how they are shopping, it's, it's new patterns have emerged and they're not going away. So this ability to stay agile is very, very important. The second thing I really want to talk about, and I was in a, in a CEO roundtable the other day, and it was interesting, the CEOs, the only thing we were talking about was the mental health of our employees. You know, we are underestimated. Yes, we're all working virtually, we're working from our homes and It's also created some incredible uh, capabilities, you know, getting talent from all over the world. You don't have to be in the same city, blah, blah, blah. All of that is great. But mental health, it's not, it's not about working from home. You are now living where you work and helping your employees, not only to be agile and learning and how they, they make impact in your company, but now we got to worry about their, their well-being which is not just health and physical, it's also mental. And so I say to all CEOs out there, um, you know, compassion is going to be an incredibly important attribute in a leader moving forward. Um, if I can just make a comment because I've been teaching at Columbia for like 30 years. Um, Agility is, is, a, is, a, is a new term and a new focus within companies. Also within academia, the Journal of Marketing was just publishing uh, on uh, agility. And now we've also had several other uh, um, management movements and over the years, like uh, one recent one was purpose, okay? The notion that you need to, or, or the core competence of a firm in the 1990s we had. Uh, so, so how does agility, meaning constantly adjusting, I guess that's what it means, being fast and all of that. Uh, how does that sort of complement 
uh, purpose and the, call it the more stable elements within an organization, like the core competency, the purpose, the mission, these sorts of things. I think you bring up an extremely important point. Um, you know, if agility is not harnessed in values and purpose, you might just have a lot of people running around doing a lot of things that because it's agile and it's quick, it's the right thing to do. Not at all. Um, agility has to be accompanied by a core. And, you know, and again, I'm going to say something a little controversial. Um, you know, I, I, I think in today's world, the, one of my favorite movies is The Godfather, right? Whose isn't? And okay. one of the great lines in the movie is, you know, it's not personal, it's business. I think those days are over. I think business has become personal. And if if you as one of the reasons I chose to come to Pernod Ricard is the core values of this company match mine. And, you know, I, I bring my whole self to work. You know, I'm I'm, you know, I'm a I'm a woman of color as a CEO, um, you know, and, and I bring I bring it all. I bring my life experiences, you know, the, the sex responsibly campaign, when we launched it, I went publicly and talked about the sexual abuse that was in my life. The fact that my mother was killed by a drunk driver. Um, you know, you have to stand up as a leader for what you believe in and your personal experiences help other employees. You know, if you can be vulnerable, then they can be vulnerable. And I do believe that we all have pain in our lives, but if we can turn pain into power, if we can take vulnerability and create it into impact, this is the new leadership of the future. And it permeates into the purpose of your company, the purpose of your brands, the purpose of your employees. And if you match that with being agile, agile where it matters, you know, that is going to be the future. It's not about uh, share of market anymore. It's about share of the future. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anne. and I see Matt coming up here because uh, he was moderating actually the, the chats and the questions that we are getting from our uh, virtual audience. Matt, what do we have? Great, wow, what a, <laughs> what a moment to come in on, Anne. That was, I, we should have ended with that button because um, <laughs> that, was, that was very nice. Um, I think one of the questions was a little, a little more about uh, best practices on e-commerce, right? Because as a company, a lot of what you've done is has been more, as we, you know, in the industry term, on trade, um, in a bar, restaurant, off trade, you know, in it, buying it from a store. So under the pandemic, like where were where were those transitions for you? Where where that online shopping for your brand was not <laughs> as common. Well, one thing people have to remember, <clears throat> especially in the United States, um, since prohibition, um, you know, we, the supplier, people who actually make the brands, we're not allowed to sell directly to anyone. Uh, we have to, we go through what's called a three-tier system. So we have to go through our distributors and wholesalers that ultimately connect with our retailers. So it makes e-commerce even more complicated. <laughs> so you know, and, 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 and I think, but at the end of the day, you know, whether it's a, many of you've used things like Drizzly or, you know, you've gone straight to, um, you know, a, a liquor store, like a Total Wines and more, right? So, you know, but the, what's, what's fascinating is, is, you know, Total Wines and more take, for example, I mean, I think their e-commerce sales pre-COVID was like five or 10%. Like today it's like 30 or 40% in less than six months, it skyrocketed. <clears throat> So, you know, for us, best practices, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we as an industry, I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball um, in terms of e-commerce in our industry. And because it's highly regulated, there's every state has different laws. And so it's a very, very complex world. But what I will remind everyone is at the end of the day, don't forget the basics, okay? Don't, for, don't forget that this is just a digital shelf. And how do you want your brand to, to show itself up in its digital shelf? How do you make it shoppable? How do you make it findable? It's some of those basic kind of those rules and heuristics you got to remember and then understand how that works in a technology platform called e-commerce. <laughs> That's great. Um, another one uh, from one of our students, uh, Sarah Smoller, was I think sort of a follow-up on, on the purpose discussion, the socio political, cultural issues, uh, which was around this, that decision-making risk assessment on staying silent, as there are some of these issues that come out. And yes, maybe your brand doesn't seem the perfect fit given its own purpose and values. How do you balance those things? 
So, you know, here, look, I, for me personally, you know, at Pernod Ricard, you know, we are a house of brands. So I have multiple options in terms of what we choose and where we choose to speak. We could either speak at a brand level or we can speak at a company level. Um, and and I, one, an, an example I'll give you, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, I still remember that week of March 16th, um, you know, my team came to me and said, you know, and we've got an opportunity to make hand sanitizers. Um, you know, our company said, okay, what do we do with this? Should we, should we make it a, a brand initiative? Should all we did was went to the government, our public affairs team, you know, we worked with Peter Navarro and in three days we got all the regulatory clearance to produce. And by the end of that week, we were making it. We have now been making hand sanitizers and we literally, we don't charge a cent. We don't brand it. We send it through FEMA. FEMA then distributes it to all first responders, whether it be fire, police, medical. Um, and it's a service we provide to the government. We ch don't charge a dime and we don't brand it. Other than, of course, it's from Pernod Ricard, but again, it's not an absolute or a Jameson initiative. Why did we do that? Because we felt it was the right thing to do. And I will tell you, um, our employees are amazing. And they feel such a sense of pride that not only are they building a business during the time of pandemic, they're doing it in a way that keeps people safe. And so you, you, we all have choices, you know, and people said, well, Ann, how can you afford this? Well, I got a p and There are other places that I can offset cost to be able to afford this. And these are, the, these are the decisions of the choices that you've got to make as a leader and understand that you have a wealth of tools by which to be socially responsible. Choose the tool that matters and go make it happen. And you were even mentioned by the president in one of the, uh, the <laughs> briefings early on, I remember. Uh, yes. I um, noticed, of course, because we do work for you sometimes. <laughs> if you noticed, he said Pernod Ricard, yes. I, no, I, I remember, I, I noticed it, yeah. Um, no, one last question, uh, I think, uh, is all we have time for. And given that we have, you know, this is intended to work with our student club and we have a lot of students on the line, talent management. Right. What kind of skill sets are you looking for? What are you expecting from the next generation of future marketing leaders? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I love it's like my passion. Unleashing the potential of talent is I, I it's why I come to work every day. And every time I meet young marketers or young business students, it's it's like that's where I get my oxygen. So first of all, anyone who's attending Columbia, congratulations. You are part of one of the finest institutions in the world. You are the future. And what I'd say to all of you guys is, remember you matter and invest in yourself. Don't just try to go for the silver ring. Go for what you think will unleash who you could be and the legacy you can leave. Don't just study subjects that you think is gonna get you the great job. Be curious, push yourself, do things that exercise both sides of your brain, the left and the right, because it's in the intersection that you can solve wicked problems. And we got a lot of wicked problems coming up in this world and we need you guys to solve it. So invest in yourself, believe in yourself, use this experience right now to just learn things that you don't know if you're gonna have an application for it, who cares? But somewhere in your brain, down the road, you're going to leverage that learning and it's going to set you apart. Excellent. That was great. And thank, thank you, you, Schmidt. Uh, it was a pleasure to have both of you. Let's give them a virtual round of applause from the audience okay. here as we transition. So, Anne, Baron, thank you. Baron, thank you. Bye-bye.